Hi, my name is Bob Grinier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So it was quite a surprise to find out that today's Russian presentation uh, on the CNT and BL uh, group uh, was an extension of the very short presentation that was given on the 17th uh, by um, Dmitry uh, Baranov. Uh, and there were two sections to this and I'm going to talk about the second section um, because he expanded on his work and there were some very, very interesting findings for me um, given about what I uh, talked about yesterday. So if you recall, I made this presentation yesterday. This is his slide. Uh, um, um, his detector here, kind of like this, except he made his own. And uh, this is what it looked like beforehand. This is what it looked like afterwards. And this was uh, after a long period of time. And it developed these scratches. And I described that how they uh, were similar to the kind of scratch parallel marks that you see here. And here in the echo fuel. And uh, that I hypothesized that they might be created by a bead chain like this uh, as observed by... Um, Ken Shoulders here and as, as observed by myself on Lion 2 uh, Fused Quartz. So uh, without further ado I'll just go through. I'm so excited because uh, <laughs> it's just amazing how y you kind of realize these things and uh, then you find it's all been done before. So, um, But that's always reassuring. So anyway um, this is uh, Dmitry Baranov uh, as he gave his presentation. He showed uh, one of his detectors. You can see it here and you can maybe see the gold tinge on the silicon uh, uh, wafer there, the, the silicon uh, plate. And uh, here is one uh, with a bit of better photographs. You can see it's very shiny, that uh, front cover. Anyway, uh, this is the kind of setup. Now, I'm hoping to get the slides uh, from his presentation uh, tomorrow. So hopefully I'll be able to share these with a lot more resolution. Anyway, I really wanted to get this out because I'm, I'm, I, I can't even get across uh, how excited I am about what we're seeing here. Anyway, so uh, here it is. This is uh, some uh, what he calls snake-like tracks. I've translated the top there just quickly. And you can see it's got this tail uh, going across the, the gold-coated silicon. And uh, it has this kind of ex structure at the top here with this ring around it. And my god, does that look like the supernova that I ended my presentation on here. So you look at this, and it's sort of da 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 boom at the end there. And uh, so uh, the other time that, that these kind of uh, tracks have been observed are with the work of uh, Matsumoto. So I'm going to go back to the book here uh, that was given to me by Sho. And you can see that uh, in this one here with the head, uh, you have a trail behind it. And here's some other ones with a sort of a trail uh, with the head. And uh, there are several examples uh, that Matsumoto gives in his book. Uh, here's some more. Uh, so you can see the long sort of wiggly trail uh, that tends to end in a head. Um, that's that's a few examples for you. Then, um, uh, where are we? Let's uh, go and have a look at... Now, I asked my question at the end of the presentation because no, nothing was said about it, and this is the question that I'm most interested in, is were there any kind of uh, transmutations to the, uh, or other elements found, where these tracks were observed? And he said yes. And so uh, what we're looking at here is the tail of the snake down here. And uh, uh, what you find is that uh, on the kind of outside here, and, and like I say, I hope to get better resolution of this uh, tomorrow, but I, as I say, I had to get it out to you. Um, when you are looking at uh, things right on the edge, you have a very, very high carbon uh, level. And as you go further in, the carbon drops, but it's still very, very high. And uh, so if you actually look outside of the area, you actually observe the gold here. Um, and this is 1.3%. So this might be uh, atom percent, I guess, maybe. Uh, and we can see when the electron beam is hitting it. This is a T-scan. So it's actually made here, like most likely made here in the city of Berna, where I'm living. Um, the the gold is only showing 1.3, but it, it's it's 
the, the beam is probably being able to get through that and show the silicon underneath. So you see this very high concentration of silicon here and relatively low concentration of uh, carbon. But as you get onto this boundary here with number four, it's very, very high concentration of carbon. And uh, this is very, very uh, in tune with what Matsumoto said. And as you go through this whole structure here, a lot of it is carbon. And uh, in fact, uh, when he was talking about it uh, at the end of the presentation, he, he said uh, this, uh, uh, and this is the rough translation uh, from the autotranscribe. It says, uh, sim uh, bismuth here in, in, in this, it can fall into many, many carbons. And the emissions of these carbons here, when you measure the elemental composition, it's more than 50% of them, uh, and so on. So uh, if I read you my last slide from my presentation, or second to last slide here, it says, uh, uh, very amazingly, it was also found later that the ring products consisted of conventional elements, mainly carbon. So that would be over 50% carbon, not dependent on collapsed materials. So he's saying whatever elements you put into these, uh, he called them, the, it called in, he called it the NATO model, and it was a, uh, a an itonic cluster, but it's an exotic vacuum object. Um, and he says that they collapse, so that the matter is collapsing. And if we go back to his slide here, so you can have a look at this in your own time, but of course. Um, you have uh, silicon in the wafer that's under there, you have gold, and it's interesting that inside this area there is no gold uh, on uh, 2 here, and there's no uh, gold on um, uh, some other locations here, so for instance on 9 up here. And there are elements such as aluminium coming in here, calcium, copper, uh, zinc. Obviously, you could assume that the bismuth is carried uh, from the um, source material, which is uh, some millimeters away, uh, and uh, it's captured into the uh, whatever it is, this cluster of nucleons, and uh, it's ejected out. And so it's actually carrying the bismuth with it. Uh, but the fact that it actually uh, there's so much material either dumped on top that the, the gold is not observed, or the gold is transmuted. Um, that is interesting in its own right. You see bromine here. Um, but it, it's mainly the calcium, zinc, copper, I think it's copper down here, uh, bromine. Uh, those are the elements that are appearing. Anyway, so uh, very, very interesting. And, and then he went and showed the head of the snake. So up here, the head of the snake. And so that's the tail. And this is the head of the snake. And uh, what you can see on the head of the snake is this ring around the outside. And remember what Matsumoto said is that the, it was also found later that the ring products consisted of conventional elements, uh, mainly carbon. And uh, he actually talked about it in the end that uh, if, if uh, Bostick and Nardi had analysed their ring structures uh, rather than just looked at the, the image, uh, they would have found that it would have been mostly carbon in the edges, the, the ring of that. And so uh, here we are looking at the ring, and you can't see the ring here so much. So this is the gold area, and uh, this is the actual edge of the ring, and it's uh, defined by 8. And so 8, actually you can see that there, is 63.79% carbon. So the actual ring that you see here, this bright ring here, is mostly carbon. And, and then as you come in to 9, it drops and the oxygen content goes up. And then as you go to 10, uh, it drops again. And this is what I have, have uh, said, is that uh, in the ring structure, you generally get uh, lighter elements, although you can get synthesized elements in there. You can see that here. You've got some zinc and uh, some uh, aluminium being synthesized in there. Um, however, uh, it's the heavier elements that tend to go to the center. And as you go and look at 10 here, uh, the bismuth, so, sort of as you go from the outside in, uh, the bismuth is going 0 0.5, 1 0.99, 4.67, and the gold is going 0 0.49, 0 0.61, uh, and, and uh, 0.77, and the zinc is 0.77, and 2.06, and so I'm suggesting that the heavy elements get caught into the middle, and the lighter elements get on the outside, and um, as uh, uh, is said by Matsumoto, 
uh, he calls this, the process is called nuclear regeneration. So you're actually able to create a spread of elements. And actually uh, what uh, these exotic vacuum objects like to do is to create the elements for life, whatever you put into them. So if you only put elements for life into them, you tend to get elements for life out, but potentially in a different balance. Um, but if you put elements that are extremely heavy in there, you also get elements for life. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's just an absolutely incredible concept to get across. And uh, it's an important aspect of what I want to share with you over the coming months. Um, so, um, now, <laughs> having said that these scratch marks, these scratch marks here, these parallel lines that he also observed on here, uh, having said that those were like uh, one of these uh, bead chains, and then like my fingers, as I said in Sochi, scratching over the surface, he actually has this image where he has a ring structure and the scratch marks coming off it. And maybe it came down here, paused for a little time and came over here or whatever. Um, but this is just <laughs> this is just astounding. I'm sorry for the very low resolution because I could only grab this off the the, the video. Uh, it was just as a preview, but hopefully, as, as I say, I'll get the the full resolution for this image. And then the next ones I want to show you are these structures. And when I'm looking at these structures, I'm thinking, oh my god, I know what these are. And uh, if we look at what Matsumoto has here, um, what have we got? Well, we have this. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. <laughs> I mean, it's just, oh dear, it's all the same thing. Um, and so this is where you would see the carbon. And remember what we saw, and I told you yesterday, this is going to be important um, uh, on the uh, 10 yen coin uh, from uh, Amaza gas testing. Now look at the kind of internal structure here and the ring around the outside. And then look at this, one of the very first, this is the image uh, that he took on August the 25th, 1990, here. And it's actually the title uh, image, and he's actually got a reference there. But August the uh, uh, 25th, 1990, and there it is. You have the ring around the outside and this structure in the middle, which is categorized like this. And there it is, the, the ring around the outside and the structure in the, the middle. And so... Uh, he's observing these same formations on his uh, samples. And here's one at the end where he's doing the elemental analysis. And I can imagine there's a very high carbon on this rim. So um, uh, what you're going to see uh, in the uh, thing from the 10 yen coin, uh, when I get to process that data, is the 3D structure of one of these, something that's never been observed before in such extreme detail. And I have to thank Alan Goldwater of Magic Sound Lab for allowing me use of his SEM uh, for many, many hours to study this and other samples and data that I will share with you in the coming weeks. But here, here we have it. Um, it's definitely carrying the bismuth. The bismuth is likely not being synthesized on this detector. So it's actually captured ions of the bismuth. Uh, yes, there is gold on this detector. Yes, there is silicon. There will always be some carbon and oxygen. Uh, it's in air. And also there was fluoroplastic involved. There's no fluorine in there, so potentially some carbon came from there. But what you have is you have very consistent data with what was observed in a range of experiments that I have studied and also those of Matsumoto. And, and so um, this is very, very exciting for me. So uh, I just wanted to get it out to you. Uh, that potentially these uh, bead chains, as identified by shoulders, are producing these scratch marks uh, and uh, that you see here, you see here, in this instance where it cannot possibly be accused of being a, a result of three-body interaction. Um, and uh, you see on his device, and you can imagine that these scratch marks have a higher concentration of the elements that were captured within the exotic vacuum object cluster bead chain. So um, there it is. Uh, uh, I just, I'm just amazed at how everything is coming together. Um, and I couldn't have asked for a better thing to happen after I pre uh, published my presentation yesterday. And, uh, you know, I'm uh, really looking forward to being able to uh, share these uh, with the translations and his comments and so forth. 
at a higher resolution, uh, hopefully uh, before the end of the week. Uh, and also to show you the 10 yen coin. So uh, thank you very much for your time and I will see you in the next video.